Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. In watching the Republican convention on Monday night, the question emerges. Is Trump and the political allies he is surrounding himself with the face of a rising, developing American neo-fascism? And if the answer is that, of, to that is yes, what does that mean people's attitude should be towards Clinton and the Democratic Party leadership, who, as we've said on The Real News Network, clearly have enabled the rise of this American neo-fascism through its own economic policies that have so increased inequality in America. Now joining us to talk about all of this is Bob Shear. Bob is the editor-in-chief of Truth Dig. He was, in the 1960s, the editor of the fabled Ramparts magazine. For 29 years, he worked at the Los Angeles Times as a journalist and as a columnist, and has interviewed at least five presidents and been to many, many both Democratic and Republican conventions. Thanks for joining us, Bob. Happy to be here. So let's start with question one. Um, is this just a kind of eccentric uh, right populist and another variance of the Republican Party? Or, or, or is this something that's gone further in, into what you could call a new authoritarianism, a, a developing neo-fascism, or such? What's your take? Well, it's precisely a neo-fascism, and I think we should explain, particularly to younger people, what we mean by this, because it's not just throwing around some frightening word, but we've had this phenomenon. We have it uh, right now in Europe. We have it where you're basically what you're, but you had it under the rise of Mussolini and Hitler in Italy and Germany. And what you're really talking about is scapegoating for real problems. There are real problems. You don't get fascist movements taking over and rising to power without people being in pain, hurting. The economy in shambles, their uh, aspirations are limited, they're worried about their future. And we have a situation now in the United States that is uh, increasingly resembling a kind of post-Weimar Germany. Uh, it's neo-fascism, it's not fascism, but basically people are perplexed. Why is life not getting better? Why is income disparity more glaring? Uh, why did my $38 an hour job in auto or mining disappear, and now I have to work for seven, eight, nine bucks an hour? You know, well, what about the benefits I thought I had? What about my ability to send my kid to college? So we have a, lo a lowered expectations in America. We have uh, a great uh, sense of pain. It's not, you know, just one region and one group of people. And it's in that atmosphere that you can basically have one of two narratives to respond. You had the Bernie Sanders narrative that said, yeah, we got real problems here. Uh, income inequality is getting worse. The good jobs are not there. The benefits are not there. And we're going to propose a progressive alternative. And that's why Bernie Sanders, you know, almost knocked Hillary Clinton out of the box, because Hillary Clinton represented the establishment that had enabled uh, this kind of pain out there. On the Republican side, uh, Trump did something amazing. He wiped out the whole Republican establishment. He did it up from Maine to Alabama. And he was able to do it across the country because people are hurting. They're not fools. They're not desperate uh, to back a fool. What they are desperate about is having a good life for, them, for their kids, for themselves, and they're worried. And so this demagogue of the right comes along with a neo-fascist message, and by that I mean precisely blaming uh, the undocumented worker, uh, you know, uh, blaming uh, people who don't have your view of religion or gay people or minorities or something of that sort, uh, blaming them for the problems that people with power have caused. Right. And that's, that's the key ingredient of neo-fascism, is to distract people from the real origin of the problems and make it think it's the undocumented Mexican worker, which is absurd. They're not the people that have, have destroyed uh, housing in America. They're not the people who did the collateralized debt obligations and credit default swaps and all the junk that Goldman Sachs and others did that brought the economy down. Uh, and, and to blame some guy who's crossed the border or some woman who's crossed the border and is trying to clean a house or help raise a kid there for your problems and not blame Chase Manhattan or, or Goldman Sachs is absurd. Right. Um, at, at the uh, convention on Monday night, uh, Chief uh, Sheriff David 
uh, Clark, who's the sheriff of Milwaukee County, uh, he spoke. Here's a, here's a little bit of what he had to say. What we witnessed in Ferguson, in Baltimore, and Baton Rouge was a collapse of the social order. So many of the actions of the Occupy movement and Black Lives Matter transcends peaceful protest and violates the code of conduct we rely on. I call it anarchy. So breaks down, Black Lives Matter breaks down social order, anarchy. Uh, th this is, is the kind of language we heard uh, in the early days of both Mussolini and Hitler. Um, it also shows you don't have to be white to, to have fascist rhetoric. Um, in terms of, you know, if Trump were successful and actually got elected, um, you could see people like Sheriff Clark having some senior position nationally. Uh, imagine a Rudy Giuliani as head of the FBI. Well, you know, basically these people don't believe in democracy and they don't believe in our Constitution uh, because the right of the people to uh, uh, assemble freely and to, you know, for redress of grievances and to exercise uh, free speech is basic to the whole American experience. And when the founders put uh, that language into our Bill of Rights, uh, there were plenty in the colonies who said, no, we can't afford this. Uh, this is a kind of uh, democracy that maybe, you know, could work in France, but it can't work here. There was a lively uh, debate about all this. People like Hamilton were not as enthusiastic as, uh, you know, say Jefferson was. Uh, but the fact of the matter is what Occupy did, what Black Lives Matter do, is they're using the First Amendment for a redress of grievances. And the real question is, who's created the grievances? You wouldn't have to have a Black Lives Matter movement if, in fact, the policing authority, the people who control uh, the police, control the cities, uh, you know, respected black lives and respected all lives. Uh, and they didn't. And so we had these terrible situations where uh, people were killed, uh, harassed in every other way. And that same thing is true of Occupy. You know, the people in Occupy, I participated in Los Angeles. I spoke at Occupy there. So did Robert Reich, who had been Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration. And, and the people there were doing what our Constitution says they have every right and deed and obligation to do. Uh, they're assembling peacefully for redress of grievances. And those movements were smashed uh, by uh, the police, by the city governments, and, and I think a very clear violation of the Constitution. So the idea that somehow democracy, free speech, assembly of people, asserting your rights uh, is somehow troubling to the established order, no, I think that's what saves a reasonable established order. It's only when the established order is failing to respond to the real needs of people uh, that you get madness and chaos. And that's what I think you're hearing at the Republican Convention. They are the advocates of chaos and confusion and repression. Right. I mean, if you listen to Chief Clark, I mean, Sheriff Clark, uh, Black Lives Matter, he said this in an interview, is essentially responsible for the assassination of the police in Dallas. Um, that's just one step away with charging them with conspiracy. Um, well, that would be like saying that Marines are responsible, right? That the fellow was a Marine. He was trained in the Marines. But the Marines are not responsible. Uh, you know, uh, uh, people uh, do get in, in violent actions for lots of reasons. But what has that got to do with Black Lives Matters, which has been an effort at using our constitutional rights uh, to assemble for a redress of grievances? How do you equate the two? It's nonsense. Right. So you have this kind of uh, absolute lying rhetoric about domestically. And then listen here to Rudy Giuliani talking uh, in terms of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, in one paragraph, uh, a, a big lie, as big a lie as we've heard uh, since post 9 11 uh, or during. Uh, here's Rudy Giuliani Monday night. To defeat Islamic extremist terrorists, we must put them on defense. If they are at war against us, which they have declared, we must commit ourselves to unconditional victory against them. This includes undoing one of the worst deals America ever made, Obama's nuclear agreement with Iran. 
that will eventually, that will eventually let them become a nuclear power and ha is putting billions of dollars back into a country that's the world's largest supporter of terrorism. We are actually giving them the money to fund the terrorists who are killing us and our allies. We are giving them the money. Are we crazy? Uh, other than the fact that it's an enormous lie that Iran is funding terrorists that are attacking America, when clearly if you want to single out any one country for that, it would be Saudi Arabia, a supposed American ally. Um, but aside from that, this call for un, unlimited, uh, un, I, I'm not getting the exact term, unconditional uh, war for victory uh, against ISIS, where uh, in the, if you put that into the context of what's been said, what does that mean? Massive bombing, a massive military intervention into Syria and Iraq. Uh, if you listen to what uh, Trump actually said during the war in Libya, even though he pretends he was opposed to it, in fact, he, there's an interview with him that's on YouTube where he called for all the American troops uh, around the Middle East to march into Libya. Uh, so extreme militarism abroad, uh, calls for domestic repression at home. Um, this is a very dangerous uh, situation developing here. Yeah, but first of all, let me separate Trump from Giuliani. I think Tr Giuliani can make Trump seem somewhat reasonable. Uh, he's just, a, you know, a really dangerous, irrational person. And if you listen to what he said, this is the same week that we had the release of the 28 pages uh, that have been withheld from us, they're still heavily redacted, that the Joint Congressional Committee, Republican and Democrat, had looked at 9-11. Uh, and, you know, of course, there were not 15 of the 19 hijackers were not from Iran. They were not Shiites. They were from Saudi Arabia. Uh, and they had proper papers. And the uh, missing 28 pages finally, as I say, heavily redacted still, but let you know, uh, the officials in the Saudi government were helping those hijackers. They were giving them money. They were helping their movement get flight training and everything. So if you're going to be a demagogue about any group of Muslims, you better start with the Wahhabi uh, Muslim faith of Saudi Arabia. And Iran has nothing to do with it. We still haven't had a Shiite uh, you know, it's like blaming Mexicans for our problems. We haven't had anybody come across from Mexico and take planes and smash them into the World Trade Center or anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And we haven't had anybody from Iran uh, uh, do it. It's utter nonsense. And the man uttering that statement has to know it's utter nonsense. He's not a fool. He's, you know, college educated, smart fellow, mm -hmm. right? And, well, and I, I quoted in a piece I did recently, I, I read a quote which says, I, I, I use emotion, emotion for, the, for the many, and I use reason for the few. A quote from Adolf Hitler. And, and we're seeing that on display uh, at the Republican convention. So, so in terms of the, you know, the rising neo-fascism, I think we agree on that. I think it's, it's rather obvious. So, so what does that mean in terms of uh, Hillary Clinton, the Democratic Party, and, and the kind of choices people have to make now? Well, first of all, you know, any time you look at these movements uh, that are quite scary, you have to say, did Trump create it by himself or Giuliani? No. Uh, obviously, social conditions have occurred uh, in which jingoism is now acceptable and fashionable. And uh, that's because we've been ha have a war machine that's been unleashed to get a new Cold War, this time against something called Muslims. Of course, we know that most Muslims in this world, the largest Muslim population country is Indonesia. We don't think of it as a center of terrorism. Uh, we've been quite cozy uh, with lots of uh, Muslim governments. And in fact, a lot of the irrationality uh, uh, on the Muslim side came because our own CIA and, and our, our own security apparatus thought this was a wonderful thing uh, to get going in Afghanistan when we were still in the Cold War and we wanted to give, in the uh, words of our national security advisors, Big New Brzezinski in the Carter administration, we wanted to give the Soviets their Vietnam. So we recruited Muslim fanatics from around the world to go 
to Afghanistan. Ronald Reagan called them freedom fighters. Uh, we celebrated uh, their activities, and that's where Al Qaeda came from, and it was financed in large measure by Saudi Arabia, to which is to this day a strong ally, uh, a major uh, purchaser of military equipment from the United States. And, uh, you know, so the hawks, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, have been stoking a certain kind of Muslim fanaticism ever since the Afghan war. We didn't hear much about right. any kind of Islamic fanaticism before that. And as I say, most uh, Muslims in the world uh, have nothing to do with this. Right. Bob, Bob, so let's let's focus on this issue of the Democratic Party conventions coming up. You've got this neo-fascism on display in the Republicans. Right now, it's very hard to, to know what poll to believe, but apparently it's relatively a close election. Um, a lot of people are talking about the issue of uh, and, and that that the, the enabler of this kind of uh, rising fascism has been the economic policies of the Obama administration and Clinton administration, of course, Bush as well, that created such uh, increased uh, expansion of inequality in, in society. And that Clinton, in spite of uh, some of the uh, campaign rhetoric, uh, there's no reason to believe she wouldn't continue more or less the same economic policies that help facilitate all this. So, so where does that leave everybody? Well, first of all, it's, it's really tragic that Bernie Sanders uh, is, in effect, being silenced now. He's rallying around the cause of the lesser evil, uh, and he's, you know, all of the really intelligent, uh, sensible, uh, needed statements he made during the campaign have somehow been put on the, the shelf now, but they remain sensible statements. We are in the midst of a profound economic crisis. The good jobs aren't coming back. Uh, living wages aren't being paid through wide sectors of the economy. The AP now has a long series going on that's very good, ex trying to explain the Trump phenomena. You know, who are the people? Well, they're in Appalachia. They used to be coal miners making 38 bucks an hour. Now they're making 7 or $8 an hour, and they can't keep families together. They can't keep food on the table. So there's a lot of pain out there, and both Sanders and, and Trump were addressing it. Uh, Sanders, in an honest way with integrity, talking about how to get good trade agreements, how to support the rights of workers, how to have a living wage. And with Trump, the reason we're using this word neo-fascist, because we saw it in Italy, and we saw it in Germany, uh, we see it now in, in Europe. Uh, 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 the rise of a movement that instead of addressing the problems of getting working conditions to be better, getting benefits to be better, getting good trade agreements, what they're talking about is blame what? Uh, the Muslims, blame Mexicans, uh, blame uh, gay people, you know, uh, uh, blame uh, Black Lives protests. It's this old-fashioned scapegoating, and it's very dangerous precisely. It works precisely because people are hurting. They're not idiots. They're hurting. Why are they backing a guy uh, like Trump? You know, who could be quite dangerous uh, to their to everybody's life with this guy having his finger on the nuclear button and but so if, forth. But, but if, but you can, if you can imagine, if you can imagine, for example, a Rudy Giuliani as head of the FBI, which I don't think is unimaginable in a Trump administration. If you can imagine Sheriff Clark, who we just heard, was some senior just, justice post, um, or certainly people that think like him. In terms of the ability to organize an independent people's movement, um, isn't there more room for that in an administration that resembles more or less the last eight years in spite of economic policies that so benefit the 1% um, than, than a more, uh, we're saying, neo-fascist administration of Trump? Well, this is the trap that we always fall into because I think... Uh no, I'm not of that view. I'm taking a very serious look at a Jill Stein of the Green Party, and I'm looking at, you know, uh, a candidate of the Libertarian Party, the former governor of New Mexico. I, I think they're making serious criticisms of, of the business-as-usual approach. And what I'm worried about, you know, right now, the New York Times today, they estimate that Hillary Clinton has a 75 percent chance of of winning, and I don't know how they that, calculate that's, that's, that. That's based on what an analysis of historical trends within swing states yeah, or something. Yeah, and and that's fine. Uh, and I think the the opposite. You know, I, it's really not necessary for people like us. 
to, to offer the great critique of Trump. The mass media is doing a pretty good job of it. And, and they're all riled up now. And you can hardly pick up the New York Times or go on any of the television shows and not have a devastating criticism of everything about Trump, and, and including unfair things like this criticism of his wife's speech, you know, uh, uh, borrow text and so forth. Why is that unfair? It was straight because uh, it's not like a, it, it was basically a reasonable good speech, and she didn't write the speech. We know that. But how many people write their own speeches? And I don't know how that language got in there, but that's not the point. She actually gave one of the few good speeches of the evening. But the reporting uh, is very strong against Trump. Uh, you know, n now suddenly people have woken up and they think he's a great menace. So, uh, and I, I don't think that's the real issue. And, and we do have checks and balances, by the way. Uh, if, if Trump should somehow manage to win, uh, there'd be a great deal of resistance in the Congress and from the courts and from the media. Uh, I think the real danger, as has been pointed out, is a president having his finger on that suitcase, on that nuclear weapon. Yes, that's quite frightening. I would ask the question, why have we allowed that to be? Why does any American president have his finger and hair trigger alert on being able to destroy much of life on the planet? But, but uh, hold on, hold on. There was yeah. no, the, the checks and balances did not work with Bush Cheney. Uh, if you listen to Kiriakou and other people who are actually listening to the morning meetings, every morning a meeting chaired by uh, Dick Cheney, which was un, un, unheard of, of all the heads of military and intelligence agency, according to Kiriakou, Virtually every single head of every one of these agencies and, and the Pentagon were against the invasion of Iraq, but we got the invasion of Iraq. So uh, you know the checks and balances when you have that kind of uh, I'm not scenario checks. don't work. Well, and, and of course the Democrats, you know, were on the whole, with some exceptions, spineless and went around, went along with it. Uh, yeah, I mean, the Democrats supported this. They supported overthrowing Gaddafi in, in Libya. They supported uh, messing up uh, Syria uh, to the point where we can't recognize it anymore in the great refugee. But go back uh, to the Green Party uh, and Jill Stein. Uh, uh, but you, but I, I, I want to challenge your, your thinking on checks and balances. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is uh, that we had a bipartisan consensus about, if you want to take it back to the economy, what Clinton did in ending the sensible rules of the road that prevented us from having another depression, reversing Glass-Steagall, uh, uh, legitimizing all of these junk bonds and collateralized debt obligations and everything, that was done bipartisan. Uh, that wasn't Ronald Reagan. That was uh, Bill Clinton, and he did it with a lot of Republican support and, and a lot of Democratic support. The, when they did the Commodity Futures Modernization Act, there were only four people in the House that voted against it. One of them was a libertarian. Yeah. Yeah, no, but but, but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting otherwise. Without doubt, the policies from Clinton on and, and, and Obama, it, it enabled the rise of this neo-fascism. Uh, frankly, if you want to have a geopolitical parallel, to a large extent, the policies of the United States post-World War I and even in, in sections of American capital helped the rise of Hitler. But that didn't make Hitler less a danger because these forces helped enable it. Um, I'm not in any way arguing that, that this neoliberalism or hyper-capitalism of Obama, Clinton, and so on didn't and doesn't continue to till the soil for the rise of this neo-fascism. Okay. Can I just uh, make a feeble uh, attempt at uh, or case for objectivity? I, 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 while I'm perfectly willing to say that uh, Trump and certainly Giuliani have engaged in neo-fascist rhetoric, that doesn't mean everything Trump has said is wrong. And it doesn't mean that on every issue he is worse. Uh, that, than the Democrats. I mean, I think his idea of negotiating with uh, Putin and uh, not demonizing Russia, which was really basic to the whole Syria policy, I think is a good corrective. He has said, uh, made criticism about overextension of American power. Uh, he has actually uh, offered uh, some cautions. And, but I think the real issue is, are we going to have a debate and a policy shift in the right direction? And what, what has to be suggested for those who want to make the case for Hillary is that four more years of this kind of establishment rule will leave us in a stronger, 
better position. And I'm afraid that's not the case. I think that, that yes, I expect that Trump will be defeated. He's kind of an absurdist figure in a way. Uh, uh, you know, pieces of him seem to fall apart uh, quite readily. Uh, but the, the objective conditions in the country are quite alarming. And if you go through four or eight more years where increased income inequality, where the average person worries about having a decent job, uh, where you have a health, let, let's talk about the health care system. Uh, Jill Stein, Green Party candidate, is a medical doctor, has you know, offered some very serious criticisms of Obamacare, not the irrational ones. The I just read a report today in California, uh, the Los Angeles Times reported that health care costs under covered California under the Obama plan are going up 13 percent this year. You know, Obamacare does not have cost control. Uh, we're at the mercy of the insurance companies. We're at mercy of the pharmaceuticals. So there's reason to be critical uh, of Obamacare. Unfortunately, Bernie Sanders, who was making some of those criticisms and actually opening the door uh, to some kind of serious universal coverage and single payer, uh, lost. Uh, do we really think that the Democrats, with Hillary Clinton coming in, are going to improve on that plan? Well, you, do we you, really? you, you don't think I'm arguing that, do you? No, I don't. I'm just saying the lesser evil argument only takes you so far. Well, I, I think the whole That's framing of this issue of, of lesser evil or evil is, is, is not the right way to frame this. The issue is, first of all, evil is this moral category. This isn't about some morality. Um, this is about from the strategic and tactical interests of building an independent people's movement, independent of both of these parties. Can you, is, can you have the same room to move, the same room to operate? Could we have a real news network? Uh, you know, can we have these kinds of open discussions? If this kind of neo-fascism becomes more full-fledged and you look at the kind of pe personalities uh, around uh, uh, Trump, like, for example, look at Pence. When Pence was interviewed by 60 Minutes, and I wish we had the clip, but it's not ready. When Pence starts talking about U.S. foreign policy, he says the root of everything, from the, even the coup in Turkey to ISIS and, and, and even the destabilization of the EU, everything comes down to a lack of American power, that there has to be assertion of American power again in the world. Um, the crushing of ISIS comes out of Trump's mouth. Um, massive, the potential for a massive intervention um, in Syria and Iraq. The groundwork is being laid again. And, and this thing of Giuliani connecting this to Iran, I don't think there's just some crazy Giuliani here. He's a, he's sure. a, he's a savvy politician. He's not, he's not stupid. Um, the, 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 and, and, you know, the kind of foreign policy nuances that Trump gave, which were, had some reasonableness to them, for example, critiquing Clinton on Libya, and being for regime change, except we know that Trump was for sending U.S. troops into Libya at the time. I mean, Trump doesn't believe in anything. I think there's clear enough evidence of that. It's more important who his allies are. Uh, let me just say this. First of all, Trump did not create these problems. Okay? Of course not. Trump is a, a, a symptom. And, uh, and, and as far as Pence, is, if I understand his foreign policy, it's really not very different than Hillary Clinton's. It, it's it, Israel-centric. Uh, uh, he has been very clear about that. that well, they the, want to undo the Iran agreement. There's a difference uh, there. Well, I don't even know if Hillary would have supported the Iran <laughs> agreement as strongly as uh, Kerry has. But uh, I think, uh, you know, remember Israel was very much, uh, Netanyahu, very much against but, but, that but agreement. Bob, I just, just so respond, far, respond to the argument I'm giving, because I'm not trying in any way to suggest that there's anything benign about Hillary Clinton and what her presidency would be. She has a long history of being connected to AIPAC, completely, uh, you, know, cl you know, much closer to Netanyahu, certainly, than Obama. I agree with you on Iran. Uh, she wanted to declare the Iranian Revolutionary Guard as terrorists in 2008 or, or 2007. And by, the way, and by the way, it was the Democrats who put John Kiriakou in prison yeah. for telling us the truth about torture. Uh, it wasn't the Republicans, and it's, uh, you know, uh, it's Hillary Clinton who calls Edward Snowden a traitor for telling us that the government does to us and spies on our, all our emails, and yet she had her own email system because she didn't trust the State Department that she was in charge of 
to read her email, but they can read all our mail. So there's a lot of contradictions. Let me answer your question in a very pointed way, because I think uh, th there's a, a serious basis. And that is, you, you're saying that force, progressive forces will do better uh, if Trump is soundly defeated. And there's a good argument to be made uh, about that. But there's also a counter argument. Uh, and the, if, if uh, Hillary Clinton is swept into office without acknowledging, this is the real problem, without acknowledging what the issues are. If Hillary Clinton, by the way, if Hillary Clinton had come out and said, you know, Bernie Sanders is absolutely right, uh, and, the, and the establishment has failed the people, and uh, we are jointly responsible, including my husband's administration, for the uh, radical deregulation of Wall Street and for the housing meltdown. This was a bipartisan mess. And, and uh, Democratic presidents, you know, uh, bear responsibility also. If there was a different Hillary Clinton running, uh, yeah, I would say that's a substantial difference. She's not saying anything of that. Uh, Bernie is now off the stage, and she's, you know, right. making some marginal... Bob, Bob, Bob. We're going to, we're, that, we're running out of time, and I'm sure we can continue this. I just want to give this. you a one-minute pointed answer to what you say. Yeah. If, if, if uh, Jill Stein can register, you know, uh, 8, 9, 10 percent of the vote and frighten these people, you know, and yeah. threaten Well, that's what I wanted to say at the very end. I just want to say, that, if, what I'm arguing. More I mean, room. That will make more room. I mean, what I'm arguing, if I could advise Jill Stein, um, I would argue what I, what I would like to see her do is call for, in swing states, if it's really close, yes, make sure Trump doesn't win. Across the country, I think there should be a campaign to get the polling numbers for the Green Party up to 15 percent so she participates in the debates. But I think it would be, it would be Hoover and she would actually gain more support if she would say, yes, if it ever comes down to it, you know, don't create illusions about who Hillary Clinton is and what corporate Democrats are. And I think to some extent Sanders has, maybe tactically he had to, I don't know. But I don't think one needs to create illusions about Clinton in order to say defeat Trump. I think that's a denial of, of the vitality of democracy. If the, if the Democrats cannot win on their own with their chosen candidate and all of the funding and all of the support they have, they got a bad candidate and you can't blame it on Jill Stein. I'm well, sorry. Well, they got a bad candidate. That, then well, that's, we're that, the ones that, that could bear the, the, we could bear no, the consequences no, of it. No, no, let, let's be clear about that. Uh, you know, you cannot blame people who take a principled position and find an audience to support them. And if Jill Stein can do that, that's a victory for democracy. And I'm all with her on that. This is not true. We should not settle for people who have created this tremendous mess in the world. Hillary Clinton among them have really betrayed the interests of ordinary working people, jailed a lot of people. You want to talk about Black Lives Matter? There are a hell of a lot of black people in jail that shouldn't be in there because of the Clinton prison stuff. Uh, the Clintons destroyed their, fam their families with dependent children, the basic welfare program, hurting a lot of people in this country, black, white, uh, brown. Obama was the, uh, the porter in chief, did a lot of bad. We had a chance for serious immigration reform. You wouldn't even have Trump having this as an issue if we put together a really good bipartisan immigration reform. Right. It didn't happen. Okay, didn't let's, happen. let's call this part one and we'll continue this. Anytime. All right, thanks very much, Bob. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.